Okay, we're going to get started, so you're not sick of me yet. Oh, I was hoping for a better response than that. Okay, so I really had a great time at the workshop yesterday. I was very impressed. You guys took it really seriously, and I could see you work really hard. So uh, what I'm going to do first is to go over some of that uh, again, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page about what the main conclusions were supposed to be. And if you have residual questions about what we did uh, in the afternoon yesterday, we can take whatever time it takes to answer all the questions. I want everybody to be very clear on uh, you know, the conclusions that were supposed to be obtained uh, from yesterday's exercise. So just a little recap on the Newtonian stuff. So there were three aspects to, uh, to uh, the problem. So one was to try to see if a black hole could support a permanent quadrupole moment, a time-independent quadrupole moment, like a Newtonian body can. And in Newtonian physics, when you work out the multiple expansion of the gravitational potential outside the body, after the monopole piece, which is the spherically symmetric part, the leading term beyond this comes from the quadrupole moment of the mass distribution. And then in principle, you can keep adding higher multiple terms to the expansion. But uh, you know, we stop at quadrupole order here just to illustrate the main, uh, the main structure. And what was key here was that the quadrupole term in the Newtonian potential was decaying as 1 over r cubed two powers uh, beyond the 1 over r of the spherical potential. And one point of the exercise was to see if, in the black hole case, there was a solution to the pertur perturbation equation that has that sort of same structure, at least when r is large compared with m. The other, uh, the second part to this, uh, to this exercise was to talk about what happens when a spherical body is immersed in a tidal field we were looking at the field produced by a remote body. That's what I'm calling the external potential up here. And then we were looking at uh, this solution, not exactly, but in a regime where r, the distance from the center of mass of my reference body, is small compared to the interbody distance. And when we do a Taylor expansion based on this, we found that the external potential could be approximated by something that grows as r squared. And in this context, this is also a solution to the quadrupole perturbation of a spherically symmetric potential. We add this term as a perturbation. And we're not disturbed that the term, uh, that the perturbation grows with r as r squared, because we know that the solution is limited to a small neighborhood around the body. We have to consider a small neighborhood, because we know that as we push the domain of the solution beyond that neighborhood, we know that we'll encounter the body, and we, look, we know that this approximation here will start breaking down. So on the black hole side of the story, the, uh, the, uh, you know, part of the exercise was to recognize that there were also solutions of this type to the perturbation equations. And then the third and the more complete version of that story is where we account for the fact that if a spherical body is immersed in a tidal field, it will, uh, you know, it will feel the tidal forces, it will undergo a deformation, and that means that you, put, you have to put the two elements of the story together. So the complete solution to the problem when you account for the tidal deformation of the body has to include the tidal field, which grows as r squared, and it has to include a quadrupole deformation that goes as 1 over r cubed. So here I express it as 1 over r to the fifth that is multiplied by r squared. We have a mixture of the two solutions. And the proper mixtures is determined by this quantity k here, which we call the love number of, uh, of that body. And that's something I'll talk a lot more about today. The love number would be determined by making sure that this solution here matches to an internal solution inside the body that properly accounts for the mass distribution and all of this. So that was the Newtonian situation. And the exercise had to do with uh, identifying what goes on if you're doing this in general relativity with a black hole. So, uh, so the first part of the story of the uh, of the exercise yesterday was to look at this mess of 
perturbation equations and try to reduce it down to something simpler based on the assumptions that we were dealing with a time-independent perturbation and only looking at the quadrupole part of the story and only looking at, uh, at the even parity sector of the perturbation. So I think people here did a pretty good job at that. Those of you who used the computer uh, went through this very quickly. I know some of you insisted on doing everything by hand. I applaud you. But uh, maybe you saw the merit of perhaps getting aid from the computer when you get boiled down you know, and, uh, and having trouble keeping track of all the terms and all of this. Anyway, I have nothing against using the computer myself to do all my work. If the computer can do it, why not? Anyway, so uh, in the end, it was all boiled down to one equation for HRR that uh, could be solved. And once you have the solution for HRR, in principle, you could uh, use the second equation here for K. So you had a handle on uh, a fully relativistic version of that quadrupole deformation that we introduced in Newtonian theory. And I think most of you got at least as far as part uh, B of the, uh, of the workshop, which was to identify the solution to the relativistic perturbation equation. And we have two solutions, one that goes like R squared, and one that is far more complicated. But if you look at its behavior for large R, you discover that it, also, it behaves as one over R cubed, when R is much larger than M. So here it was not specified, but what uh, I was expecting you to do is to think about this in relation with the Newtonian discussion. There was this troubling aspect here that this solution grows with R squared, and therefore if you imagine that this solution is supposed to be valid all the way to infinity, you would think that it would blow up at infinity, of course it would, and based on that you would be tempted to reject the solution. But uh, what uh, you know, I was hoping you would think about is you know, how to relate this solution to the Newtonian discussion in a context where the solution is not meant to apply all the way to infinity. It's only meant to apply in a small neighborhood around the black hole because we're only working in this neighborhood in an approximation where the remote bodies are far away. So in that sense, the growing r squared solution is just as valid here as it was in the Newtonian discussion, because it only applies to that small neighborhood. We're only working in a small neighborhood around the black hole. We're not trying to go beyond that neighborhood where the remote bodies are. We're working in a context where r is small compared to the interbody distance. So that was the solution that, uh, that is meant to represent the tidal field in which the black hole is immersed. And for this solution, with its leading order behavior at large r going as one over r cubed, it's the second solution here that was supposed to represent the quadrupole deformation of the black hole. And the key part of the story here was to notice that if you look at this solution, when r goes to 2m, you see something very bad happening here. And you also see something bad happening here. f goes to 0. The log of f goes to minus infinity. So this solution is singular when you approach the event horizon. The solution is meant to apply all the way down to the event horizon because it's, uh, you know, it's a solution that's supposed to represent the entire perturbation from the black hole horizon all the way out to large distances. So if the black hole were to have a permanent quadrupole moment, that black hole would have a badly singular event horizon. So you cannot have both. You cannot have a regular event horizon for a black hole and a black hole that has a quadrupole moment. You have to give up one. I like to keep the horizon regular. Therefore, I have to give up on, uh, on, on the quadrupole moment. So in the next part of the problem, you are asked to reflect on the acceptability of the... Uh, Oh, that's part, uh, sorry, part D, of, uh, part C over here. You are supposed to reflect on the acceptability of that solution. And, uh, and uh, the point was that, well, if you want your black hole to have a regular event horizon, which we all do, uh, then you were supposed to reject that solution on physical grounds and say that a black hole cannot support uh, a, a permanent quadrupole moment. And that's, you know, a simple statement of the black hole uniqueness theorem or the black hole no hair theorem, 
a black hole that's non-rotating. It has to be perfectly spherical because if it had bumps, it would be described in terms of a multiple structure and uh, that would necessarily introduce a singularity on the event horizon. That's true for the quadrupole deformation. It would be true for any higher order multiple that you might wish to uh, consider for a black hole. So the conclusion here is that the solution is not acceptable on physical grounds for a black hole because it would replace the horizon of a black hole by a pretty bad singularity. So that was the conclusion I was expecting here, and I think uh, many of you uh, got there. Um, if you're not dealing with a black hole and you're dealing instead with a spherical body that would be deformed, uh, then there's no obstacle because uh, here in this context, the Schwarzschild solution would be valid outside the body. The body would be larger than 2m. So if the perturbation appears to be singular at 2m, it's of no concern because you're supposed to stop the solution as soon as you encounter the matter. So the singularity of the solution at 2m is outside the domain of validity of the solution. The solution only applies outside the body, which is itself outside of 2m. So the objection that we see arising for a black hole is no longer valid for a material body, and there's certainly no obstacle for a material body to have a quadrupole deformation and higher, moment, uh, you know, higher moments in addition to that. And that's the situation that we also encounter, of course, in Newtonian physics. In Newtonian physics, bodies can be deformed. Only black holes are restricted to be purely spherical if, uh, if they're non-rotating. So that was part C. Part D, uh, part D had to do with the black hole in the tidal field. So then it was a matter of identifying the R-square solution as the tidal field, uh, coming to grips with the fact that R-squared grows to infinity at infinity, but the solution is not meant to apply beyond a small neighborhood of the black hole, so it's perfectly acceptable for that reason. So it does describe the tidal environment in which a black hole might be placed, and it's in very direct analogy with the Newtonian situation. In fact, you know, the R-squared solution in GR is exactly the same as the R-squared solution in Newtonian physics. So that's, uh, that was the conclusion here. And uh, I was asking you if you would expect any changes to occur if you were to replace the black hole by a material body. And the answer is no. Uh, you know, the tidal field in both cases doesn't care about whether your body is a black hole or, uh, or a material body. It only cares about what the you know, external bodies are. So no changes were required to adapt the solution from a black hole to, uh, to a material body situation. And then finally, uh, so the, the, the last part was to put everything together. And uh, the question was, well, if you place the black hole in a tidal environment, does it acquire a quadrupole moment as it would, uh, as a body would in Newtonian theory? And then based on conclusion in part C, while well, you had to reject that because a quadrupole moment would imply a singularity of the event horizon, that quadrupole moment is measured by uh, the love number. And the conclusion here is that if you want the black hole to stay regular, which we all do, uh, you had to declare that the love number of a black hole is zero. For a material body, there is no obstacle for the reason I explained. And uh, the love number for uh, a material body would certainly not be zero. But for a black hole, it has to be zero because it's that coefficient that multiplies the, sol the solution that goes singular on the event horizon. The last part uh, is a reevaluation of this uh, of this regularity uh, condition. So, uh, so the key part of the argument for all that you know that we were talking about is the fact that the perturbation is seen to go singular on the event horizon. But that's, uh, you know, that's a subtle point because we're looking at components of a tensor, the metric perturbation is a tensor, and we're looking at its components in a coordinate system that's known to be singular at r equals 2m. So we all know that the t-coordinate of the Schwarzschild metric goes singular at, uh, at the event horizon. In terms of t, uh, the crossing time into a black hole is infinite. And that's just you know, a manifestation of the fact that T is a badly behaved coordinate on the black hole horizon. And it's always very suspicious or always very delicate when you look at the 
components of a tensor in a singular coordinate system and try to decide whether the tensor itself is a well-behaved tensor or a singular tensor. So as a technicality, and the last part, and I think some of you managed to, uh, to, to get to that, was to try to reevaluate this regularity of the perturbation in a coordinate system that's actually well-behaved. So the simplest coordinate system that allows you to look at the metric at the event horizon is uh, one that's based on this advanced time coordinate. Where do I have that? Uh, yeah, so if you replace the coordinate system, if you replace the time coordinate by a coordinate V that is tied to the behavior of incoming light rays, uh, then you find that the background metric, the Schwarzschild metric, acquires a regular form. You no longer have a singularity of the metric at the event horizon. And that allows you to look at components of tensors in that coordinate system. And if in that well-behaved coordinate system, the components of your tensor are well-behaved, you can conclude that the tensor itself is non-singular. But if the components in that coordinate system are badly behaved, you can conclude that the tensor itself is a singular tensor. And if you work through this, you will find that the singularity that was identified before in the metric perturbation at r equals 2m is actually preserved. HRR is badly singular on the event horizon, and that's true even in the well-behaved coordinate system. And that, uh, I think, uh, sells the deal. It, you know, it, it really closes the deal on, uh, on the singularity of the perturbation. So even in this more refined uh, you know, analysis, uh, you do find that perturbation would be very singular on the event horizon, and that just confirms the previous conclusions. So I hope that many of you uh, got through uh, all of that story, but uh, I just wanted to be clear that all of you did. So uh, that's what I uh, was doing now. So any, you know, so we can take the time to answer any questions about any of the stuff that you encountered yesterday. Uh, I think uh, I think you learned a lot, and I want to make sure that you really, really, uh, you know, capitalize on that. So uh, any questions? Yes? Sorry, so the of the Does this advantage for time dependent No, so uh, so uh, <clears throat> so all that we've talked about here is restricted to time independent perturbations. If you uh, you know if you put in processes, if you uh, imagine a perturbation that's sourced by a time dependent uh, source, for example, uh, you know gravitational waves coming in or something like that, uh, then, uh, you know, those solutions are no longer valid and you have to turn on the time derivatives and it certainly changes the conclusion. So it's certainly possible for a black hole to have a time-dependent quadrupole moment, but what is not possible is for that, you know, quadrupole moment to remain non-zero after the time dependence has gone away. So when the black hole resettles to a stationary state, uh, you know, any trace of deformation has to disappear. So it turns out that the notion of, of love numbers is really restricted to uh, almost static or, you know, very slowly moving uh, uh, perturbations. So perturbations that don't change very much uh, as a function of time. If you want a fully dynamical description of this, you have to go beyond this notion of love numbers and you have to look into uh, you know, the relationship between the source and the quasi-normal modes of the black hole, and it becomes a much more complicated story. But it's a good question, because it's important to understand that love numbers are, you know, one way of describing the tidal physics of bodies, but it's usually restricted to very slow-changing situations. It doesn't apply to all, you know, aspects of tidal dynamics. Yep? Uh, please ask again. I think that those are certainly related concepts, and I think the, the vanishing of love numbers is a way of you know, stating the, uh, the uniqueness theorem for the Schwarzschild black hole. Uh, but there's also a uniqueness theorem for the Kerr solution, 
And that's also, uh, you know, something that reveals the limitation of the description in terms of love numbers, because love numbers are really good to describe radiations from spherical bodies. But even in Newtonian physics, if you imagine doing this for a rapidly rotating star that is already deformed because of uh, rotational motion, the centrifugal forces, uh, there's no useful notion of love number for that because you have a deformation on top of the deformation and it becomes a little bit hard to describe purely in terms of uh, love number type quantities. So again, so the context for love numbers is, I think, restricted to, you know, it's, you know, it's really restricted to spherical bodies that are deformed slightly in, you know, very slowly type, you know, time changing situations. For theory that Uh, so, for maybe not all, but for a very broad class of scalar tensor theories, the black holes of general relativity are also the black holes of uh, those uh, alternative theories. So many alternative theories, in fact, have the familiar appearance of black holes because the, the, the additional degrees of freedom become trivial in that context. But there are certainly alternative theories that don't have Shorts of black holes, or for which the black holes are very different. And for those theories, I don't think there are unique theorems. And I don't know what you would have to say about love numbers. Probably there would be more freedom for those black holes to have non dimensional love numbers. But I haven't studied that. I think they're like GI. Yeah. Because um, you can't have everything black holes because they're relatively small. So you could just drop some of the assumptions. Would all of them uh, rotate black holes? So this the scale of the ahead or whatever doesn't have the spherical symmetry now. Any other questions, comments? So, uh, yeah, so the idealization here is that you might have a remote body creating tidal forces, but we were idealizing this external body as not moving. And that's a bit of an extreme idealization. Uh, what was really important here is not so much that it's not moving, it could be moving slowly. What was important is that the time scale associated with that motion, which would be the orbital period, had to be long, very long, compared to the internal time scale associated with the black hole which is M. So, so long as the external time scale is long compared with M, it's justified to neglect the time derivatives. That's an approximation, but it's a very good approximation. So, you know, physically it doesn't have to be static. That would be problematic because it's hard to have moving bodies that don't move. Uh, but so long as the, you know, the object is far away and moves very slowly, then uh, that, you know, that static or almost static solution So, so that raises a very interesting question. So the, the, the statement that the love number vanishes is not the statement that the black hole doesn't deform. Let me yank this here. So love number being zero means that there's no external particle moment, but it doesn't mean that the black hole itself doesn't deform. Let me yank this. So the black hole deforms. There are, there's a tidal field, it, you know, it deforms because of that tidal field. The statement that love number is zero just means that it doesn't deform more than it has to to account for the tidal field. So, and the way to describe this is to look at the actual shape of the event horizon. I mean, you can, you can work with the apparent horizon if you prefer, you can work with the event horizon, and you can describe the intrinsic geometry of this event horizon, and that's an observable, that's a perfectly you know, gauge and gradient observable, safe, coordinate independent way of describing the deformation of black hole, and you find that, yes, I mean, the, the shape of the event horizon is certainly not spherical. It will be bulging in the direction of the external body, like the oceans of the Earth would, uh, but yet you still don't have a quadruple moment description of that. 
So there's an alternative way of describing the deformation of the body, not in terms of what it does to the gravitational potential outside the body, but purely in terms of how much is the surface disturbed. So there's a measure of tidal deformation on Earth, which would just be, you know, how high is the tide? And, uh, and there's a notion of love number that applies to that, and that notion of love number, if you apply it to the shape of the event horizon, would be non zero. So two notions of love numbers, one to describe the shape, of the body, uh, that's not the one that I talked about. The one that I talked about is the second notion of love number that describes the perturbation and gravitational uh, potential. So yeah, bottom line is that the black hole certainly deforms in a way that can be measured in, uh, in gauge invariant waves. Uh, and, uh, and it's certainly true that the black hole is not hysterical because of the tidal deformation. Can I ask a question also? Yeah. I, I know that those two notions of love numbers in Newtonian gravity are related. Is it true in GR? Uh, it's true in GR. So in Newtonian physics, if you're dealing with fluids, the relationship is very simple. Mm -hmm. If you're dealing with bodies with composite structure where you might have you know, a solid core and then fluid and so on, the relationship can be complicated. In GR, it's even more complicated because it really depends on uh, the compactness of the body. So there's a relationship that can be worked out, but it's a complicated relationship. But yeah, I mean, they are related. Yeah. And, you know, the shape of number is not vanishing even when uh, the, 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 uh, the gravitational left number is. Other questions? Great, so I think you learned a lot yesterday, right? Good. Okay, so what I wanted to do today, and uh, now I have to apologize because I'm gonna be recycling stuff that I talked about at previous schools. Um, what I wanted to talk about is more on love numbers for not just black holes, but neutron stars, and the importance of love numbers and tidal deformations on gravitational wave physics. So Alessandra sort of hinted at that in her lectures. I'm going to pick this up and talk a little bit more about this. And uh, if you uh, have read the literature on gravitational waves for the last couple of years, uh, it's become a very hot topic. And the latest event where two neutron stars uh, merging together producing gravitational waves was measured, that became a central issue to see if in the gravitational waves we could actually see hints of the tidal deformation of those neutron stars. So I'll talk about this uh, graph over here because it really motivates this uh, interest in tidal deformation in the context of gravitational waves. So let me explain this. This graph shows the comparison between the phase of a gravitational wave that would come from two different systems involving in one case, a black hole and a neutron star, and in the other case, two black holes of exactly the same mass. I mean, here we have a neutron star of 1.4 solar masses, and we have a black hole that's three times as heavy as this. That's system A. System B has two black holes, also of 1.4 solar masses for one, and three times as heavy for the other one. So two bodies of the same mass here and here, but here one is a neutron star, here we have two black holes. So we have two systems, they each produce gravitational waves, so they go around each other like this, almost on identical orbits, they in spiral almost identically, but not identically. And what this graph here measures is the phase difference between the gravitational waves emitted by system A and the gravitational waves emitted by system B. And as you can see here, the systems slowly go out of phase with one another. The phase difference builds up from zero at low frequencies to you know, beyond one radiant at higher frequencies and almost, for some uh, systems, almost to two radians. I'll explain why there's three curves here in just a second. But let me remind you first that uh, what, uh, you know, what is really crucial in gravitational wave measurements and gravitational wave uh, extraction of source parameters is to be able to have templates that follow the phase of a gravitational wave very accurately. It's the phase match that guarantees that you will get very good overlaps 
between your template and the signal, and it's that phase match that ensures that you build up a very high signal-to-noise ratio that allows you to do all of this beautiful stuff at not just you know, claiming detection for the gravitational wave, but also uh, be able to extract source parameters like the, mass, uh, the masses, the spins, and all of those beautiful things. So to have templates that have phase accuracy is really the crucial aspect of doing data analysis with gravitational waves. If you find that your template is going out of phase by even as much as one radian over the entire in-spiral, you're not doing the best job that you can, and that will impede uh, your ability to extract reliably the source parameters. You will have introduced bias in the uh, parameter measurements that could really spoil your ability to do astrophysics with all of this. So even one radian, that doesn't seem very much. It's, you know, it's far less than two pi, but even, uh, even one radian is, is bad enough, and two radians, well, that's the end of the world. You don't want that. Okay, so why three curves? I told you that system A contains a neutron star, but when I say neutron star, I really don't know what I'm talking about. Well, I know it's neutrons, but I don't know the, uh, you know, the equation of state for nuclear matter at those extreme densities that we find inside neutron stars. We know a lot of nuclear physics. We can take very heavy neutron, uh, nuclei and study their structure and all of this. But when we do this in labs on Earth, we approach nuclear saturation density. Uh, I forget the exact value for this, but that's, you know, that's basically the highest densities of nuclear matter that you can find in you know, normal conditions on Earth, for example. But when we talk about nuclear matter in neutron stars, we're talking about densities that are at least an order of magnitude beyond nuclear saturation density. And at those high densities, we know very little about nuclear physics. There are huge uncertainties as to the description of nuclear interactions at those densities. And therefore, when we talk about the structure of neutron stars, we really don't know very well what we're talking about. There are tons of models, tons of you know, nuclear groups that have postulated you know, plausible models for equations of state beyond those extreme densities, but we have very little certainty. So, how does that translate into astrophysics? Well, in order to understand, for example, the relationship between the mass of a neutron star and its radius, we have to know the equation of state. And if you don't know the equation of state beyond, you know, something very qualitative, something very uh, inaccurate, well, that relationship between mass and radius is very poorly understood. For example, we don't know whether a 1.4 solar mass neutron star is likely to have a radius of, say, 8 kilometers, or 10 or 12 of 15, that's the range of our uncertainty about uh, the properties of uh, neutron stars. Observations can help. We have very good observations of masses of neutron stars, mostly in the uh, context of binary pulsars, but uh, measurements of radius uh, are very uncertain. They're subjected to very large systematic uncertainty. We'll know more in the forthcoming years because of new uh, you know, new uh, scientific missions like NICER and things like that. But uh, the point remains that we have very little knowledge of the radius of the neutron star, and uh, that reflects the fact that we have very you know, little knowledge about the equation of state of nuclear matter at those neutron star densities. So I'm talking about a neutron star here, but I'm talking about a neutron star for which the internal structure is very poorly known. And what this graph shows here is three models for an equation of state for a neutron star based on plausible nuclear physics, but different nuclear physics. And uh, one neutron star happens to be very small, the other one is in the middle, and the third one happens to be very big. So what do you need to produce a very big neutron star? You need an equation of state that produces a lot of pressure for a given density. That's called the stiff equation of state, and if the, if the pressure is very high, it will push back against gravity, and that will produce a neutron star that's big. If, on the other hand, your equation of state produces less pressure for the same density, you don't have as much fight back against gravity, and that produces a neutron star that tends to be smaller, because gravity tends to win over pressure. Of course, you have equilibrium, but the equilibrium requires uh, you know, a smaller object if the equation is soft compared to a big object when the equation is stiff. So what we have here is 
an equation. So we have uh, we have a neutron star here with a given equation of state that has this lovely name here that happens to produce a small equation of state. That's a soft equation of state that produces uh, that produces a neutron star with a small radius. That one of, over here is a stiff equation of state that happens to produce a neutron star with a large radius. So what's going on here? What this graph shows is that if the neutron star is big, the dephasing is large. If the neutron star is small because the equation of state is soft, the dephasing is small. And in fact, it's probably too small to be detectable. Why do we care about the size of a neutron star, and what the, you know, why does it impact the phasing of a gravitational wave? Well, it's tidal effects. When the neutron star, so you have a neutron star in a black hole, when they're far away uh, from each other at low frequencies, the tidal forces that one acts on the other, uh, you know, exerts on the other, are very small, and the bodies don't deform very much. But when they get closer, as you move up in frequency, the tidal forces become noticeable. And a large neutron star will deform more than a small neutron star. So the tidal effect on a large neutron star is higher than on a small neutron star. So a large neutron star will you know, deform and that will change the orbit because you know the or the you know the black hole is no longer going around a spherical body; it's going now around you know a deformed body. That one over r cube term in the Newtonian potential will have an impact on the orbit. There's a little bit more to that story, but that's essentially the effect. So you are no longer uh, you know dealing with spherical bodies moving in the m over r potential producing a very nice circular orbit, you're talking about deformed bodies that move in a deformed potential. That includes now the 1 over r cube term. And that changes the orbit. And the effect scales, the tidal effect scales like r, the radius of the body, to the fifth power. So a small difference in radius from small to big produces a really, really large tidal effect. And that's why a large neutron star moves on a very different orbit from a small neutron star. And that's why you produce a dephasing in the gravitational wave that's large, because the orbital motion has been, changes, uh, has been changed so much that the gravitational wave that you know, reflects this orbital motion uh, you know, can reveal that. So there's a lot of excitement these days, because we're on the brink with gravitational wave physics of being able to detect deviations from the motion you would expect for spherical bodies and detect the tidal deformation of a neutron star if it happens to be big enough to give rise to a large effect. That's the excitement that we have. And if we measure this tidal dephasing that we see here, we can conclude that the neutron star was big, not small, and now we learn something about the nuclear equation in state. So from gravitational waves, and repeated measurements of this sort, we're not there yet, but we might be in a few years' time. With repeated measurements like this, we might get you know, a collection of you know, statistics about the relationship between mass and radius for neutron stars, and that allows us to say something about the nuclear equation of state at densities that go well beyond what can be produced in the lab. So I hope the story is clear, and I hope that you can see that if, you know, we have access to measurements of the sort through the dephasing of the gravitational wave as you compare different you know, uh, neutron star models. Uh, we have access to all of this exciting physics. So black holes are boring. Black holes don't do any of this. But neutron stars are very, very interesting to study from gravitational waves for other reasons, but you know, also because of this uh, measurable tidal physics that can take place here. You had a question? Yeah? Yeah. So James, so this is all uh, you know the phase that you accumulate purely in the spiral part of the motion, uh, and that is something that doesn't rely heavily on numerical relativity. In fact, you know, as, as Sandra explained, we have very good models 
to describe the purely inspirable motion of black hole based on post Newtonian theory, and then you know, very strict to, uh, to gain better accuracy from the post Newtonian physics. The tidal uh, aspect of this can be also incorporated into those models. And we don't need a lot of numerical relativity to, to do this. What we do need, though, is to be able to infer the lot numbers of neutron stars. And that requires just a, a, you know, a very modest amount of computational work just to calculate the perturbation equations associated with neutron stars. And that's what I'll be talking about, how, how that's done in, in the next few minutes. So of course, as the neutron stars merge, uh, then you get all the physics that happens at merger. And there's a lot of the nuclear uh, physics that can be revealed at that stage. And of course, you get a lot of mass ejected. You have all the you know, nuclear processes that take place uh, at that point. And of course, that's led to uh, you know, the production of heavy elements for the R process and all of those good things. So there's a ton of physics that, that you can do with neutron stars, and that makes them very exciting. Yep? Uh, we, we, we don't know it very much. So what I mean is, like, do we expect it to be polytropic, or...? Uh, so, a polytrope is not a bad approximation if you're, you know, willing to live with 30% accuracy or something like that, so, you know, probably not good enough. Uh, there are, uh, so what people do in practice is that they have, let's say, 100 nuclear groups in the world who worry about these things. They each in, you know, incorporate what, what physics they think is the most important uh, for nuclear matter at high densities, and then they come up with equations of state. And you can plot a whole list of equations of state, maybe hundreds of them, and, uh, and that basically brackets what you think any model should be. So maybe you don't believe this one over here because it's at the extreme. Maybe you don't believe this model over here because it's another extreme, but it's probably somewhere in between. So you can sort of bracket the, uh, the range of possibilities. And that's how you come up with plots like this. Sorry, I'll go back. What you tend to do when you study these things in the sort of absence of detailed knowledge is that you look at That's sort of one extreme. That's sort of the other extreme, and that's sort of where it's plausible that it might be in, you know, in nature. That sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, the range of uncertainty is pretty high. Uh, even the composition of nuclear matter at high densities is unknown. So, is there phase transitions to strange, you know, quark matter? Is there, you know, uh, k on condensates? I mean, there are all sorts of possibilities for nuclear matter at high densities and there's just very little experimental guidance because we can't reproduce those, those densities. So I kind of like the fact that you know, gravitational wave scientists can actually teach nuclear matter physics to nuclear physicists. I, I, I really like that. Anything else at this point? Yeah. Uh, uh, Island fields and fields are higher order, no? In the Prometheus expansion. So they are higher order. Yeah. Yeah. How well can be they measure uh, that, that's a very delicate point, and uh, I don't think we know the answer at this point. Uh, and I don't think I'll mention that point, but you've put your finger on something which is a little bit embarrassing. We know how to incorporate the tidal physics, but we know that at the same post newtonian order, it comes with all sorts of other effects that we don't know, uh, we haven't calculated yet. So the uh, the, the danger of playing this game is that we don't understand the systematics of the measurement just yet. Uh, people have been thinking about this, they've been trying to find various ways to deal with it. I'm not sure to what extent it's all convincing, but uh, you know, it's not going to stop us. But yeah, you're right to question a little bit the, uh, the, uh, the underpinnings of, of, of this. Yep. I think uh, numerical simulations are important no, for the Bernan signal. So if the final body is not a black hole, right. but you have something like a magnetar or an intermassive electron uh, star or so on. No, I think this this messy signal that, that you get with you need numerical simulation. No? Oh yeah. No, that's right. So as I was saying before, uh, to do the in spiral. 
uh, we can do a pretty good job without too much uh, numerical simulations. But to do the merger, uh, to deal with the merger, then you know there's really no other way than to actually do numerical simulation of, of neutron stars crashing into one another. And uh, that can be very exciting because while it's still sort of a matter of debate to some extent whether the final object, and it will depend on the masses, whether the final object collapses immediately to a black hole or survives as a hypermassive neutron star for some time or whether it survives for a very long time, uh, that merged object will be highly deformed. It will oscillate at the quasi-normal frequencies of the neutron star. That will have an imprint on the gravitational waves. And those measurements, of course, can teach us something uh, very important about neutron star physics. It's a bit unfortunate that if the neutron stars are small, the merger occurs at very high frequencies beyond the reach of LIGO. If the neutron stars are big, uh, the merger occurs at lower frequency, and that might be uh, within the reach of LIGO. So if we're lucky, the neutron stars are big, the merger occurs within the LIGO band, and we see the tidal physics. If we're not so lucky, the neutron stars are small, we don't see any of that. I like big neutron stars. Okay, so uh, that was the motivation. I think the, the, the main point of my lecture today was this, understanding the potential of measuring tidal interactions in, uh, in uh, a neutron star, either binary neutron star or neutron star black hole system. And I think you'll uh, hear a lot more about this in the coming years. So I thought that, so for... Um, the next little while, what I would like to do is to describe in a bit more detail how we go about calculating love numbers, uh, not just for black holes. You've done that calculation already. You know, it's zero, so that's done. But how would we do it for, uh, for an actual neutron star? So how do you calculate these things? Because that's an input into, uh, into calculations like that. So I wanted to explain this uh, a little bit. And uh, what I'll do is to move on to another lecture that I gave last year on this stuff. And I'll start by looking at the situation in Newtonian physics, and then I'll move on to a relativistic version of that. So I'll, I'll, I'll go right into uh, you know, a, a fairly uh, detailed uh, discussion of this, because now we have a lot of experience with uh, doing similar things. So I think you can, uh, you know, you can you can face, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I'm going to uh, tell you here. So let's think about what we're trying to do in a purely Newtonian setting, and then I'll generalize this to GR. And, uh, you know, I think the workshop will have taught you that GR involves more technical details, but the, you know, underlying issues are very much similar. So if you understand the Newtonian discussion, then the GR discussion is just you know, the same thing plus a few more details. So let's think about all of this in Newtonian terms. I'm looking at a body that's going to be uh, you know, imagined to be in a binary system, and the other body is out there at a large distance, and uh, it's starting to exert tidal forces on my reference body, and that's what I want to describe. So I have a self-gravitating body, mass m. It's going to have a radius r. If it were all alone in the universe, it would perfectly spherical, but uh, now it's going to be suffering uh, the tidal forces from the other body, and because of that, it will be deformed. So uh, that body is placed in uh, a tidal field created by its companion body, and the first thing that I would like to do with some you know, precision is to uh, describe the tidal potential in which my body is immersed. And I'm going to use the same trick here uh, that I used for the workshop document. I'm going to think of the remote body as being far away. I'm going to think of its <coughs> of the potential that it creates, and I'm going to take a Taylor expansion of that external potential in powers of x, which is the position vector, away from the center of mass of my reference body. So I'm taking the external potential created by the remote body, and I'm doing a Taylor expansion of this in powers of x, the distance from the center of mass. When I do this, I simply take my external potential, I'm calling it u remote here, I'm calculating a whole bunch of derivatives, and I'm multiplying that by a whole bunch of powers. That's my Taylor expansion, 
all those co coefficients here that I'm calling curly E become functions of time because my derivatives are evaluated at the center of mass uh, you know, in the course of this theory expansion. So the potential that are, you know, that's creating uh, the tidal forces is a sum like this where I have increasing powers in the distance from the center of mass. And that's something that grows with R, but again, we're fine with this because that description of the tidal potential is limited to a neighborhood around the body. In the, uh, in the workshop, well, I considered the leading term in that expansion, the L equals 2 term. So I had uh, something that looked a little bit like this, except that I expressed it differently in terms of spherical harmonics in P2 uh, instead of in Cartesian form like this, but that's exactly the same thing I was talking about. So one key assumption here is that the tidal forces are going to be weak, so I'm going to describe the tidal effects in perturbation theory. And another key element here is that, and it's a related thing, is that the time scale for the variation of the tidal field is going to be long compared to the internal time scales that I can associate with my reference body. So I have two time scales here that are relevant. One would be the external time scale that would correspond to the orbital period of the, uh, of the binary system, and that would be given by the distance to the remote body cubed divided by the, uh, by the mass. So that's the orbital period. And then we have an internal time scale that would characterize, for example, hydrodynamical processes inside the body, and that would scale like the radius of the star cubed divided by the mass. So as long as the body distance, the internal body distance is large compared to the, the body radius, then I'm in a situation where this time scale is very long compared to that time scale. So I have built in this approximation here, and this approximation basically tells me that the time variation here is, you know, is pretty much irrelevant. I can neglect time derivatives because the time derivatives acting on fluid variables inside my body would be subjected to the internal time scale, but the external forces, you know, behave on the external time scale. So as long as I have this situation over here, I can neglect time derivatives. So that's what I was talking about a little bit earlier, that even though my tidal forces are in reality time dependent, I can still think of them uh, as static because all time derivatives can be neglected in, uh, in the perturbation equations. So that's the tidal environment. That's the tidal potential in which my body is immersed. And I want to calculate the effect of this on the body itself. That's where I have to face the task of you know, making up what I want for my body and solving all the details of the interior. So in everything that we've talked about so far, we were only focusing on the exterior solution, never face the details of the interior. But if I want to calculate the love number for any body, I have to specify what that body is made out of. And of course, if we're dealing with complicated objects, that modeling can be very complicated. Here, I'm going to assume the simplest thing I can assume. I'm going to take my body to be a perfect fluid, and I'm going to take the perfect fluid to have the simplest possible equation of state. Turns out that this is not so bad for neutron stars. I mean, neutron stars sort of behave as perfect fluids with a very simple equation of state. And therefore, I'm not doing something completely radical here. Uh, it's remarkable how good a job even the simplest state so if I want to describe the inside of my body, of course, I have to uh, make up this model. So it's going to be perfect fluid. And that means that I have two sets of equations that will be uh, governing the physics uh, of, uh, of my body. Uh, one is going to be you know, dealing with gravity, and the other one is going to be dealing with the fluid. Uh, gravity in Newtonian theory is described by Poisson's equation. I wish I were related to this one. But uh, and the fluid is governed, if it's a perfect fluid, it's going to be governed by uh, Euler's equation. And Euler's equation is just a statement of F equals MA for each fluid element. This is the acceleration of the fluid element, V would be its velocity, rho is the mass density. And the forces on the right hand side consist of either pressure gradients or gravitational forces. So it's F equals MA where the force is given by pressure gradients or and gravity. We have an equation that tells us that mass is conserved. That's the usual continuity equation. 
And if we want to have a complete set of equations, we have to specify the equation in state. If you do this for normal stars or complicated fluids, you would expect the equation of state to depend on at least two parameters. Typically, you would take the density and the temperature to be the two uh, independent variables. Uh, here, I'm assuming that temperature is irrelevant. That turns out to be a very you know, good approximation for neutron stars. Neutron stars consist of highly degenerate matter. The internal temperature of a neutron star is very small compared to the Fermi temperature. And therefore, you might well uh, assume that the neutron star is at zero temperature. And entropy, for example, doesn't play a role in the physics of neutron stars, at least you know, if you're close to equilibrium. So a one-parameter family of equations of the state here is all that we need to do a pretty decent job of modeling. But that's because I'm thinking of neutron stars instead of you know, thinking of uh, you know, normal stars that would have you know, radiation transport and the temperature distribution and all of those things. I'm doing something as simple as I can get away with. All right, so those are the governing equations. I start with a body that would be unperturbed, an isolated body that would be nice and spherical. In hydrostatic equilibrium, we have an equation for gravity, and we have an equation that says that the fluid is static, therefore, the pressure is balancing out the gravitational forces. And I think probably in our career, uh, we've all solved equations like this for spherical stars, those are simple things to do, and you can build a complete model for a star if you know the equation of state based on those equations. What I do want to do, though, is to go beyond the, you know, the unperturbed situation. I want to consider the impact of the tidal forces. And what this means is that I have to take my unperturbed quantities here, and I have to allow for changes. So I take my Newtonian potential and I say it's going to be what it used to be, the perfectly you know, spherical solution I used to have. I'm going to account for this perturbation, which would, which would be the body's contribution to, uh, to uh, the Newtonian potential. So that's the perturbation in the body part of the Newtonian potential. And then I have this part here, which I introduced in the previous slide, that describes the tidal field. So I introduce this as an external perturbation the body responds by creating this perturbation, and uh, my entire gravitational field is what I used to have, plus the perturbations. The density will be deformed. The density, which used to be spherically symmetric, will be deformed. So my density variable will be, will be, uh, will be modified. Because of the equation of state, my pressure variable will be, uh, will be perturbed as well. So now I have to consider all those equations again, but in the perturbed context. When I consider the perturbed equation, well, you know, the uh, gravitational potential will still be related to the density, but now it's going to be a relationship between the perturbation in the density and the perturbation in the gravitational potential. Hydrostatic equilibrium will still hold because of the separation of time scales that I talked about. We're not disturbing the, uh, the fact that the object is in hydrostatic equilibrium. We're just disturbing the equilibrium itself. So it's a new equilibrium and uh, involving not just the original pressure, but the, you know, the, uh, the perturbed value for the pressure, and that involves you know, the perturbation in density and all of that stuff. So all of this is just a restatement of this when I include the perturbation and linearize all the equations in the perturbation. So that's the system of equations that I have to face and I have to, you know, integrate in order to, uh, given the titled environment, decide what will be the new perturbed equilibrium of my star. And now the details uh, start to matter, so uh, what I'll do here is what I would do in black hole perturbation theory. I will take all of my variables, expand in spherical harmonics, and turn the crank. Instead of inserting the metric perturbation inside the Einstein tensor, I would, you know, insert the perturbed variables here into my equations, turn the crank and try to reduce down uh, those perturbation equations to a system of equations that I can deal with uh, and you know, simplify it to the fullest extent and deal with that. So, we're going to expand in spherical harmonics. In the exercise yesterday, I was you know, only looking at leading order stuff, so I had only L equals 2, but in principle I can do that for you know, all terms in the spherical harmonic expansion. 
the first line here is a bit of a technicality, but the stuff here that gives a description of the tidal Newtonian potential, the tidal potential, is something that maps very nicely into an expansion in spherical harmonics. Each term in the Taylor expansion corresponds to a given L. The leading term here uh, corresponds to L equals 2, and I can re-express all of this in terms of spherical harmonics in a very nice way. Uh, the reason why this happens is because this tensor over here that I get by differentiating the external potential uh, happens to be a symmetric trace-free tensor, and symmetric trace-free tensors have a very nice relationship with spherical harmonics. Uh, if you don't know anything about symmetric trace-free tensors, forget what I just said. That's just a technical remark. So the external perturbation that I introduce has a natural expression in terms of spherical harmonics, <coughs> That certainly motivates, in addition to the fact that my background solution was spherical symmetric, that motivates an expansion of all variables in uh, spherical harmonics. So to all my perturbations here, I introduce a spherical harmonic interposition. So I will be dealing separately with each LM mode of my perturbation, because all the equations will nicely decouple. Uh, each LM mode will be separated from all the other LM modes. If I do that, I end up with uh, simplified versions of my main equations. So I have you know, Poisson's equation that, after this reduction in spherical harmonics, becomes uh, you know, an ordinary differential equation in the radial variable. So those are all the LM modes of my Newtonian perturbation, uh, the perturbation in Newtonian potential. And Poisson's equation becomes this simple-looking second order differential equation with, of course, the perturbation in the density on the right hand side. So I have that, that comes from Poisson's equation. I can look at the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium that tells me how the pressure relates to uh, the gravitational forces. And that is an equation that I can integrate immediately and that tells me that the pressure perturbation is algebraically related to the gravitational perturbation, both coming from the body itself, that's what this is, and the tidal field that is given to us as an external perturbation. So the pressure perturbation is you know, directly related to the gravitational perturbation in this way, and uh, that's one of my equations solved uh, like this immediately. And then, while well, I have an equation of state that relates the pressure to the density, that means that if I know the pressure perturbation, I automatically know the density perturbation. So what do I have? Well, to solve this equation, I need to know this. This is related to the pressure perturbation. The pressure perturbation is related to the gravitational perturbation. So I plug all of that back in, and I have, finally, a completely decoupled equation for the gravitational perturbation that I can solve. It's a very simple-looking equation that I can solve very easily because it's just an ordinary differential equation. And that completely solved the problem. When I have this, uh, you know, if I have this after solving this equation, then I have the pressure perturbation. And when I have the pressure perturbation, I have the density perturbation. And that's all I need to determine to, uh, to completely describe the perturbed interior of my body. So that's how you deal with the interior. And the, the key aspect here is that you have to decide what kind of material you're dealing with, and you have to specify an equation of state. All of those are key elements. So now we have all the equations that we need uh, to solve for the interior, and I build up my gravitational perturbation, the perturbation and gravitational potential from the center out to the surface. At the surface, I have to match with the external solution. But the external solution, we already know. That's what we've, we've been working on. We faced all the aspects related to the exterior before. We never faced the interior until this morning. But now we know how to deal with the interior. All we have to do is to match the internal solution to the exterior solution. And the exterior solution is the one that tells me that my body is deformed. Therefore, in addition to the m over r potential, I have a quadruple term, I have an octuple term, and I have all the higher order L terms in addition to that. So what the external solution tells me is that outside, I have a multiple moment divided by the appropriate power of r. And if I'm working with L equals 2 at leaning order, this will be the quadruple moment divided by r cubed. 
at the next order, I would have the octopole moment divided by r fourth, and so on and so forth. That's the external solution. So I start from the interior, I go all the way to the surface. I, uh, at the surface, I match smoothly with this solution over here, and then I'm done. I have, the I have the complete description of the problem, both inside and outside. I'm skipping a few steps here, but all of this basically will determine for me the relationship between the quadrupole moment, or the, you know, the multiple moment uh, that describes the deformation of the body at each L order with the tidal field. So doing this internal work, doing the matching with the exterior, will tell me how the multiple moment associated with the deformation of the body relates to the specification of the tidal potential. So that was uh, the thing that was related to the Taylor expansion of the external potential. After doing all this work, I have this relationship between that and the multiple moments of my deformed body. There are some conventional factors that come into it. That's just historical stuff. There's a scaling with r to the power 2 l plus 1 that comes straight from numerical uh, dimensional analysis. That's to make sure that the dimensions of this are properly related to the dimensions of that. When l is equal to 2, this is 5. So that's the scaling with the five powers of r that you noticed yesterday and that I was telling you about earlier. The key quantity here is that KL. That KL is really encapsulating all of the details of the interior. We get a relationship like this no matter what the interior is. All of the details of the interior are contained in that one quantity, well, for each L, that one quantity that, of course, encapsulates all of the details of the interior. So the hard part, you know, the, the outcome of all of this and the hard you know, part of the calculation is to calculate that KL quantity, which is known as the love number. We have a love number for L equals 2, L equals 3, and you know, so on. So that is you know, what gives us the relationship between the deformation of the body and the sophistication of the tidal field. And that's the stuff that we've been talking about. But now you see that this is something that uh, needs to be calculated, taking into account how the interior responds to the tidal field. Uh, so that's another version of the same result where I'm re-expressing everything in terms of uh, Cartesian tensors. It doesn't matter. What really matters is that we have this relationship between the tidal field and the deformation of the body. And the key part of the relationship here is the love number in addition to the scaling with the radius here. So one more slide and then we'll break. Let me just make this even more concrete by just focusing on L equals 2. When I'm talking about L equals 2, I'm talking about two derivatives of the uh, remote potential. So the remote potential is the external mass divided by the distance between the bodies B. When I take one derivative, I get M over B squared. When I take two derivatives, I get M over B cubed. That's the size of the tidal information. That's what we have over here. We have the five powers of the radius. We have the quadrupolar love number. And then we have this conventional two-thirds that is just you know, conventional stuff. Here's the tidal field. Here's the quadrupole deformation of the body measured by its quadrupole moment. And that's measured by the density multiplied by this uh, little tensorial structure here. That's two moments of the mass distribution. And uh, we remove the trace. Uh, all of my tensors here are trace free. So that's the quadrupole moment. That's the tidal field. That's the key relationship. And if we put everything together, we find that the uh, Newtonian potential, you know, truncated like this at, uh, at lead, leading order, will contain the unperturbed part. And then will contain the perturbation that has two pieces, one coming from the tidal field, and the other one coming from the body's response to the tidal field. And that's an expression you've seen before. What I've filled uh, this morning is the gaps that will tell you how this is supposed to be calculated. And that number K2 uh, will really tell us whether we're dealing with you know, a body that's small and dense versus a body that's big and uh, diffuse. All of that information is contained in K2. I think I'll stop here because I think I've gone on long enough. So let's take a break, and then I'll show you
uh, some values for K2, and then we'll move on to the relativistic uh, side of this after the break.